we're discussing something very, very bad. Albeit, it's not one. It's not the worst thing the Japanese did during World War II, but it most certainly is very, very bad. The Bataan Death March. For those of you who are not aware of what the Bataan Death March was, basically it was after the Japanese, they captured the Philippines and basically all of the enemy opposition that surrendered, they basically made them march an eight-day march. And during that time, between 5,000 and 18,000 POWs died. They were denied food, water, and it was also excruciatingly hot. Is this the same one he talked about in the previous one of his videos that we watched, or is this a different one? I think it's a different... I think it... I th uh, it sounds like exactly the same description. No, it was the Marshall Islands. It, that was a different one. Basically, uh, they they were so good at defending it that basically the Japanese were just like, okay, we aren't going to kill you, we aren't going to torture you, but we're going to send you to our prison camp. So basically, they knew, they knew that if they killed them, they'd make them into martyrs. This one was different because this was horrifying. But apparently, the ghost of Bataan, Arthur... Vermouth, uh, a one-man army with 116 kills. Damn, that's a pretty good KD. I mean, 116, 116 and one. That's that's pretty ridiculous. The fat electrician is going to tell us all about the Ghost of Bataan. So let's uh. Let's check it out. If you were to ask me to name one person off the top of my head that should have been awarded the Medal of Honor but wasn't, it would be a toss-up between Jake McNasty McNeese and this guy. Ah, nasty. Today we're talking about the one-man army, Arthur Wermuth, or as the Imperial Japanese Army referred to him, the Ghost of Bataan. This video is brought to you by Operation Good Boy. It's an online subscription service hey, that every month will Puffer. send you and your dog a care package. <laughs> this month, me and Mushu got a first aid kit for when we go on walks, a water bottle for when we go on walks, some dog poop picker-upper bags, some daily supplements for him, and a couple bags of his favorite treats, TREs, treats ready to eat. Right on the show. <laughs> Good job. See, Mushu approves. If you're not really into online subscription boxes, you can also buy the treats, the supplements, or the gear individually over at OperationGoodBoy.com. And regardless of what you get, you're going to get 15% off when you use the discount code QUACK15. So go check them out. Thanks. Let's get back to the video. All right, important background info. December 7th, 1941, Japan attacks America at Pearl Harbor. Okay, everybody knows what Pearl Harbor is, but what most people don't realize is that while Japan was attacking America, they were also simultaneously launching attacks on pretty much every other nation and island island in the Pacific. Hong Kong, Wake Island, Guam, Malaya, Singapore, Thailand, all of these nations and islands would fall to the Japanese within three months. All of them except for one, the Philippines. If you don't know, at this point in time, the Philippines is actually a territory under the United States of America, who had assumed control of the Philippines from Spain after the, the Spanish-American Spanish War in 1898. Because of that, there was already 22,000 soldiers there. Now, don't get me wrong, they weren't expecting to get attacked. The majority of these soldiers, 12,000 of them, are non-combat related jobs or they're Filipino reservists. But that other 10,000 was the Philippine Scouts. And I cannot stress to you enough that these guys are absolute gangsters. They were founded in 1901 by the US Army. It is essentially Filipino and Filipino-American soldiers being led by American officers, and they are experts in guerrilla, anti-guerrilla, and Oh, that's warfare. badass. These are the guys that... Is it is... And they are experts... It's like, uh, like you look here... All of a sudden, a bunch of dudes. Yeah. Spot the enemy. I don't see him. I don't see him. Oh, shit! Anti-guerrilla and jungle <laughs> warfare. These are the guys that fought the Tan Sung rebels during the Moral Rebellion. They are literally the men that America's patron saint of hole punching, John Moses Browning, created the Colt 45 1911 4. They are nice. the direct predecessor of the Philippines' current special forces, the Scout Rangers, and they are probably some of, if not the last people on the planet that you want to fight in the jungle. And one of the American officers leading these men is none other than Arthur Wermuth, son of a World War I veteran that grew up in Chicago. For high school, he would attend Northwestern Military Academy, and after graduating from there, he would be denied by West Point because the only thing he excelled at in life was football and winning fist fights. His football coach said that defensively he was a tough man to get through and offensively many points were scored through holes that he opened. Despite being rejected nice. by West Point, he still wanted to be a military officer. So he would go to college at Loyola University in Chicago where he would join the ROTC program and get his bachelor's degree in bacteriology, which would later become known as microbiology. So after graduating from college and receiving his commission as a military officer, he would write the United States War Department requesting to get put on active duty. He would get accepted 
accepted and sent over to the Philippines where he would arrive in January of 1941 to train with the Philippine scouts. Fast forward 11 months later, the Japanese show up and they attack. Filipino and American forces are not ready. They are outmanned, outgunned in every conceivable way. At this point, leadership decides their best bet is to pool all of their resources and have everybody move to the Bataan Peninsula. They are essentially gonna back themselves into a corner, draw one line in the sand and desperately try to hold that line long enough for American reinforcements to show up. It's not a great plan, but it's pretty much the only thing they can do. And if that yeah. wasn't bad enough, there's actually a problem with that. The Japanese are advancing so fast that they're gonna be able to cut off the route to Bataan before everybody can actually make it there. So now Arthur Wearmouth and the rest of the 57th Infantry Regiment are gonna have to go and fight the Japanese on the front line desperately trying to hold them off long enough for all the other people to retreat. General Wainwright gives them the order to dig in and hold, and that's exactly what Arthur and his men do. At this point, Arthur is in command of Delta Company of the 57th Infantry Regiment, which is roughly 150 Philippine scouts. And for the next two weeks, they go toe to toe with the Japanese army, desperately trying to hold them off long enough for everybody else to retreat. This was how Arthur and his men would spend Christmas of 1941, dealing heavy losses to the enemy. But by New Year's, they had faced the same thing and endured heavy losses themselves. By the first week of January 1942, Arthur's 150 men had dwindled down to just 37. At this point, it Damn. became clear that they were not going to be able to hold the front line, at which point they were ordered to retreat back to Bataan. But Arthur had a plan to slow down the Japanese even further. Arthur volunteers to sneak back into a city that recently fell to the Japanese by himself because in that city, there's a wooden bridge, and that wooden bridge is going to prove vital for the Japanese to quickly move troops further inland. And if Arthur can get rid of it, it is going to severely hamper their ability to do so. So, so Arthur is going to sneak into the city by himself with demo charges, his Thompson submachine gun, and two five-gallon jugs of gasoline. He is then going to make his way to Main Street under the cover of night, dump the gasoline all over the buildings, and light Main Street on fire. Once all the buildings in Main Street are engulfed in flames, that is a signal to the Philippine scouts miles away that they're going to start dropping artillery on that area, and Arthur is going to use that as a distraction to make his way over to this bridge, place some demo charges, and blow it up. And that's pretty much exactly what happens. <laughs> Arthur sneaks into town, manages to light Main Street on fire, waits for the fire to grow a little bit, at which point Arthur knows the artillery fire is coming right on top of him any second, and he just has to make a run for this bridge. But this bridge is wide out in the open right next to Main Street, and he is about to run essentially down Main Street towards a bridge that's being guarded, and there is hundreds of Japanese soldiers everywhere. All right, that seems easy enough. Thankfully, most of them are distracted by the fact that most of Main Street is on fire, and not a lot of them take notice of the fact that there is now a 190 pound American sprinting down Main Street towards the bridge. <laughs> but eventually a couple of them would take notice and begin firing at Arthur and he would be struck in the calf and fall to the ground. And right Shit. then is when the artillery rounds started dropping. And as soon as the artillery rounds started dropping, Arthur waited there for a second and then when he thought they were all distracted again, he got up and continued to run towards the bridge. He then proceeded to place the demolition charges, blowing up the bridge before disappearing back in the jungle and making his way back to his men. So Arthur and his men make it to Bataan. At this point, you have to put yourself in Arthur's shoes. He is one of the highest ranking officers on the ground. He was just in charge of 150 men two weeks ago and only 37 of them survived. That's not necessarily his fault. He was placed in a completely unwinnable situation, but ultimately, he's not gonna feel great about himself losing that many of his men. He's been living in the Philippines for almost a year, training with the Philippine scouts. He's an expert in camouflage, an expert in jungle warfare, and an expert in guerrilla warfare tactics. And he decides that rather than lose any more of his men, he is gonna go out past the front line into enemy territory by himself and terrorize the enemy. So that's what he does. He sleeps during the day and every oh. night he grabs his Damn you, Internet. He sleeps during the day and every night he grabs his Thompson submachine gun, two Colt 45 1911s and a bunch of grenades and heads off into the jungle by himself to utilize hit and run tactics against the Japanese conducting guerrilla warfare. And on one of these missions, he's a couple miles into enemy territory from the front line when he hears a bunch of Japanese soldiers coming up on him. So he quickly hides in some bushes and camouflages himself and 30 Japanese soldiers, an entire platoon comes walking past. One of them almost steps on him and he's just laying there dead quiet, trying <laughs> not to breathe. And the troops are making their way towards the front line. And Arthur knows he has to do something because they're either gonna launch an attack or they're getting reconnaissance to scout the front line. Either way, 
these guys gotta go. He knows that even if he pops up with the element of surprise from behind them with his Thompson submachine gun, he's still gonna lose that firefight. So he does the only thing he can think to do, and that is to get up and start walking in the column with these guys as if he was one of them. So he is literally following in this Japanese column, walking through the jungle towards the front line, at which point he decides, hey, I gotta make sure these guys don't look back and actually try to get a look at me because I'm wearing a different uniform. They're gonna notice. So he decides that every time one of them steps on a twig or makes a noise, he's gonna shh. So they be more quiet, just reassuring that really? like, oh, that's obviously not an enemy behind me. Work? It's somebody trying to get me to be quiet because they're on my side. Arthur Wermuth <laughs> has just switched gears from John Rambo to Bugs Bunny fucking with Elmer Fudd. And he follows <laughs> these guys through the jungle. <laughs> okay. That John image. Rambo to Bugs Bunny. That, with the carrot and the bunny ears. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's like, uh, that's all. Like, uh, what's up, Doc? Fucking with Elmer Fudd. And he follows these guys through the jungle for miles, just shushing them the entire way. And then when they finally get up to the front line, Arthur knows that he has to do something. He has to alert his guys that they're about to attack. So he does the only thing he could think to do. He quietly pulls a pin from one of his grenades and then acts like he tripped on something, stumbling to the man in front of him, grabbing a hold of him for balance. And when he grabs a hold of him, he hands the grenade to him right in the guy's chest. That guy obviously grabs it and Arthur runs off into the jungle. The Japanese soldier's like, wait, what? Oh God, boom, he blows up. <laughs> <Then Arthur comes. laughs> That's dope. <laughs> it's like, here, hold this. What? Oh, fuck. <laughs> Is it, that was a bit on as to He's like, here, hold this. It was a, literally a bomb. And the he, guy walks away and you're just like, well, okay. Then the guy comes back and takes the bomb. And he's like, thanks. Like, it's like, shit. Turns around with his Thompson and opens fire on the rest of them. This obviously alerts his men and they start opening fire too. They completely wipe out this Japanese platoon. After this and other events like it, the Japanese start to fear Arthur, referring to him as the ghost of Bataan, while the American forces are referring to him as the one man army. At this point, he gets his notoriety and other experienced Filipino scouts start volunteering to go out with him, but he doesn't want to lose any more men. So he keeps refusing and he keeps refusing. And finally, there's one brave Filipino scout that he can't refuse because this guy will kick his ass. His name is Sergeant Crispin Jacob, AKA Jock. He is described as being six foot four, 220 pounds. And Arthur Wermuth himself said that he is half Filipino, half Oriental giant. And he begins going out <laughs> on these missions with Arthur. And time after time, Jock manages to save Captain Wermuth's life. At some point it becomes apparent that the Japanese are intercepting frontline communications. But here's the thing, these communications aren't done over radio. They can't just be intercepted wirelessly. These are hardwired communications with a physical wire just strung out on the ground. This means that somewhere along that wire, the Japanese have tapped into it physically, and Arthur Wermuth and Jock are sent out at night to investigate. So they're tracing this wire down all night long, just following this wire, following this wire, and at some point in the darkness, they lose track of it. So they're trying to refine where the wire went, they're looking, they're looking, Arthur gets his legs tangled up in a vine and he falls down. No big deal, he pulls out his knife, goes to cut the vine. Oh shit, wait, hold on, this is the wire. At which point he looks over to yell at Jock like, <laughs> hey, I found it, and he looks, and there is a ditch with a Japanese soldier and a bunch of equipment sitting in it, looking at him like he's dumbfounded. Arthur quickly draws his gun <laughs> as the Japanese soldier draws his, and they have a good old fashioned quick draw contest, which Arthur wins. Arthur then quickly making it back to his feet is then tackled by two Japanese soldiers into the ditch, one of them stabbing him with a bayonet through his arm, pinning him to the dirt wall inside of this trench, at which point he yells for Jock. Jock then runs up to the edge of the trench and sees Wermuth inside the trench fighting off two Japanese Japanese soldiers with his arm pinned to the wall. He takes aim with his rifle at the Japanese soldiers and then realizes that he doesn't want to accidentally hit Wermuth in the middle of the fight while it's still dark out. So he jumps in the trench and proceeds to beat the two Japanese soldiers to death with his rifle. He then destroys Damn. the radio equipment, helps Wermuth pull the bayonet out of his arm. He starts bleeding everywhere. He bandages that up and gets Wermuth back to the hospital, at which point the ghost of Bataan is now bedridden and on doctor's orders is not allowed to leave. And while all that's going Ooh. on, finally makes it back to America that there's some crazy 190 pound ex football player running around in the jungles of the Philippines showing the Japanese what's up and this is the <laughs> one shining piece of good news that America clings on to in the days after Pearl Harbor. Arthur Wermuth unknowingly becomes an overnight celebrity in America. He is taking up all the headlines. They are making comic books about him and his partner Jock. 
He is inside of bubblegum packets telling the story of them finding the tap in the communication line. Arthur Remoth is now one of the first main characters in World War II fighting for America, and he is vital for overall American morale. And just like a main character, he decides that he's not going to stay bedridden. He violates doctor's orders, checks himself out of the hospital, and gets back in the fight. At this point, the Japanese have flooded the entire surrounding area with snipers that are picking off American and Filipino soldiers day and night, and Arthur Wehrmuth has to be the man that does something about it but considering that there's so many of them it really and sounds like there should be a video game life, about this guy yeah at least a movie <laughs> if he comes to the conclusion that having some friends around isn't exactly a bad idea so he starts taking volunteers to join his special anti-sniper unit and 84 of the meanest most experienced philippine scouts volunteered not only were these guys counter sniping the snipers there was also a bunch of them out in the jungle camouflaged and hidden waiting for the sniper to fire so they knew where he was and then they were going to come at him with machetes and colt 45s throughout february and march of 1942 arthur say it sounds like it sounds like a it sounds like it should be on the banner to Florida. Welcome to Florida, machetes and Colt 45. Wehrmuth, Jock, and their anti-sniper unit were credited with taking out 500 Japanese soldiers, and this is considered Damn. to be a very conservative estimate. Then in late March, command would ask for volunteers to do a nearly impossible mission of recapturing the high point of Mount Pukat, at which point Arthur immediately volunteered and then asked his men who of them would also like to volunteer and they all did. Arthur and his men then set off Damn. to try to complete this nearly impossible mission. It is a 36 hour hike through enemy territory just to get to the objective. Along that 36 hour hike, they are credited with taking out an additional 65 Japanese soldiers. Then upon reaching Mount Pukat, they would launch an attack and it would fail. Arthur would lose over half of his men. Having Damn. failed to take the high ground at Mount Pukat, Arthur and his surviving men would retreat back to Bataan. Along the way, they would get ambushed by a machine gun position, and Arthur would be struck in the chest with machine gun fire. Arthur would then wake up in a field hospital back at Bataan, where he was informed that the bullet went through his rib into his lung, and he was now battling an infection. I would assume they didn't have antibiotics to give him, because at this point, Bataan was in rough shape. They were down to half rations, and they were running out of every supply imaginable. Desperately trying to to hold out long enough to get resupplied and reinforced. Arthur would remain in the hospital for 10 days and every single day that passed it became more and more apparent that they were losing and Japan was going to win. At this point Arthur against doctor's orders with pus oozing from his chest still battling an infection would don his gear and go back out with his men one last time. Arthur Damn. and his anti-sniper unit desperately tried to hold the line against the Japanese but due to sheer overwhelming numbers they were beaten back over and over again and during one of their retreats on April 9th Arthur would slip down the side of a cliff smacking his head on a rock, rendered unconscious. He would again wake up in the hospital, but this time when he awoke, he would come to find out that the Japanese had completely taken over Bataan, the Americans had been forced to surrender, and General MacArthur had fled to Australia. This is absolutely the worst possible outcome because the Imperial Japanese believe that if you surrender in battle, you lose your honor, and if you lose your honor, you are no longer human. You are subhuman and no longer eligible for human rights, which gives them the justification to treat you however they want. Arthur Wehrmuth is bedridden, having been shot in the leg leg, stabbed in the arm with a bayonet, shot in the chest, concussed, and battling an infection, and he is probably one of the luckiest men there. Because pretty much everybody else is forced to participate in the Bataan Death March, and I don't really want to get too far into what that is and what happened, but suffice it to say, over 30% of everybody else is going to die in captivity as a prisoner of war. And if Arthur Wehrmuth were also forced to go down the Bataan Death March, he would absolutely be a member of that 30% given his current condition. I can't verify this for sure, but I think the reason that they let Arthur Wehrmuth have a chance at surviving is because technically he never surrendered. He was fatally wounded <laughs> in battle, and when he woke up, he had already been captured. So fatally I wounded in battle multiple times, by the way. I think that maybe the Japanese didn't look down on him as subhuman because he didn't forfeit his honor. He literally fought until he lost consciousness, and by sheer luck, he survived and woke up in captivity. After making his recovery, now Major Wehrmuth would find himself being the highest ranking military officer around, making him the leader of the few remaining Americans that were lucky enough to escape the Bataan Death March. And for the next year, they are used as forced labor to build Japanese airstrips. One of the Americans under the command of Arthur was a man by the name of Elliot Smessler, who later on in life would write a book of memoirs about his time as a prisoner of war under the Japanese. In that book, he wrote this, quote, the first year of my captivity, I worked on building an airfield for the Japanese. Life wasn't bad because they were afraid of the major in charge. 
His name was Major Wermuth, and the Japanese called him Wermuth the Lion. Now, I think this Damn. is actually further evidence that Damn. the Japanese don't believe that he actually surrendered and didn't lose his honor in battle because they are still scared of him despite the fact that he is their prisoner. And he definitely didn't surrender because while Arthur and the men under his command did build the airstrip they were told to build, huh. they sabotaged it so that the concrete would buckle underneath the weight of Japanese heavy bombers, <laughs> not only damaging Damn. the airstrip, but the bombers as well. Nice. Yeah, despite being a POW Damn. for over a year, Arthur and the men under his command are still finding a way to slow down the Japanese military. Because of this, Arthur and the men under his command are sent to live on a hell ship known as the Oryoku Maru, which if you don't know, a hell ship is essentially a POW camp on a boat and they are infamous for their horrific living conditions the only thing worse than being a starving pow is being a starving pow on a boat with no shade while you're seasick then on january 9th 1945 the uss hornet an american aircraft carrier would mistake the hell ship for a troop transport and bomb it this bombing would kill over 250 Americans instantly, wounding and injuring almost every other American on board, including Arthur Werman. Despite having his wounds go untreated while starving to death, Arthur still somehow managed to survive, making it to Japan to be inside of a POW camp there, where he would later be freed after Japan surrendered. When Arthur Wermuth shipped off from America to the Philippines in 1941, he weighed 190 pounds. When he finally got to return home to America after World War II, he weighed only 105. He would then be awarded four Damn. Purple Hearts, the Silver Star, and the Distinguished Service Cross. He is credited with 116 kills and will go down in history as the one-man army of Bataan. Despite this, he credited his men, saying that 90% of what he was able to accomplish was due to the Philippine scouts and that they were the best soldiers in the world. So in conclusion, the fall of Wake Island in the Philippines are considered to be some of the first losses dealt to America during World War II, but in many ways they were also some of the first victories, as stories of heroes like that of Hank Elrod and the Marines of Wake Island and Arthur Wermuth and his Philippine scouts reached the rest of the world. It would become clear to America that this war was winnable, and it would become clear to Japan that they had a a lot bigger fight on their hands than they ever anticipated. Thank you yeah. for watching. Best way to support the channel is go check out thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. There you go. I can't believe even after all that stuff and everything, like he actually survived <laughs> to come back home. Dude, <laughs> it's it's unbelievable. It really is. The, Louis Zamperini is also another one. Like the the hell he went through, uh, being tortured in the uh, Jap in the Japanese prison camps, so bad. And not only that, but they also threatened him. Basically, he was forced. Like he had a railroad uh, cross tie. You know those wood bars uh, that they have underneath the. Uh, uh, railroad tracks. He was forced to lift it up over his head and hold it up over his head and if he didn't then he would have been shot. He held it up there so long commanding officer basically told another soldier to go up and like hit him in the stomach make him drop it. It didn't go down instead it like went down to his shoulder commanding officer just got his gun out ready to shoot him. Then Louie, in just like a pure act of defiance, just like lifted the thing back up over his head, screaming, like just from like the agony that he was in, because not only was he was dehydrated, he hadn't eaten in days, and he was forced to do that. It's just like, damn. And because of that, you know, the commanding officer of the Japanese got intimidated and basically just came up and smacked Louie in the face and told, and he told another Japanese officer to like, you know, put him in chains and put him back with his friends. Louie survived and everything. I remember there was actually, I forget what year it was. I think it was, uh, it was when the Olympics came back to Japan. I can't remember what year it was. They arranged a meetup between Louie and the commanding officer who tortured him. Louie wanted it. Louis wanted to forgive him, but in the end, the commanding officer, at the 11th hour, right before Louis was, about, was supposed to meet with him, he backed out. He backed out. Like, dude, that's just... It's probably slightly afraid the dude was going to kill him. Maybe. Japanese were brutal during, during World War II, and, you know, all the evidence being there, you know, Bataan, you know, the, their prison camps and the labor camps, like, oh, their treatment of the Chinese. Nanking alone is worthy of just, like, just, oof. Anyway, that was the fat electrician talking about the ghost of Bataan, Arthur Verma, and uh, hopefully you all enjoyed, and hopefully we'll see you all in the next one. So until then, I'm Nate. I am Nick. Y'all be good people. Take care. Peace.